Hey everyone, welcome to the June 2022 update on the performance of my solar array. I'm sorry this video is a few days late. I um, ran out of space on my hard drive, so I wasn't even able to render the video. But I've managed to get myself a new one, so let's crack on. Uh, first of all, the disclaimer, please pause the video and read it. I'm not an expert, I'm just sharing my knowledge with you for educational purposes. And if you're interested in any of this equipment, please get qualified advice. In terms of the referrals, I still have the same ones, Octopus and Enphase. So if you'd like to join Octopus, use the link um, over here, which is also in the video description. Um, if their website doesn't allow you to sign up, you can still give them a call and sign up and instead quote the reference number that you see here on the screen. And then both you and I will receive the £50 referral um, voucher from Octopus. If you want to join Enphase, the way it works is I have to recommend you. So drop me an email with your personal details and then I will submit that off to Enphase for you. All right, so let's take a look at the numbers. So the magic number here is we produced 911 kilowatts of energy using our solar array and that was you know free electricity for the house. So fantastic. Um, as you can see from the slide, June was a pretty good month. Um, even on the bad days, we were still producing a good amount of electricity. So 911 kilowatts was produced by the array. We exported 63.9 kilowatts back to the grid. And this is basically the tiny little trickle of export that seems to happen every day by the system. And then we had a few days around the 21st and 22nd of June, which were particularly good. We were generating you know, 40 plus kilowatts in a day and we simply had nowhere to put it. We had consumed it in the house, we had done the hot water, we had charged the car to the max, and so I had no choice but to send it back to the grid. So our export numbers are a little bit higher, not because there was a problem with the system, but because we simply had surplus electricity. We did import a bit from the grid, so 39.8 kilowatts was imported from the grid, and this was um, towards the earlier part of June, if you see the the graph, the grey bits above the blue, that's import from the grid. And this is because there were a few days of dodgy weather earlier in June and we had depleted the battery. It wasn't lasting all night. And then we had to pull a bit of power from the grid before the sun came up. But then the sun wasn't particularly strong on those days. So whilst it was just about meeting the need of our house, it wasn't creating a surplus to charge up the battery. So we had a few days of weather like that before we got on top of it again. Overall, the house consumed 887.6 kilowatts, um, and that includes us you know, trying to use up this solar power. Looking at the energy independence, we've managed to get it up to 96%, um, which means we only pulled 4% of our total power consumption from the grid. Uh, the rest of it was free. And if you consider that we exported 40 kilowatts, if we were able to consume those, sorry, we exported 63, but we imported 39.8. If we were able to you know, store the power at the right time, then we would have been able to reduce our import even further and increase our energy independence. Looking across to the right hand side, then you see um, the, the diagram of the solar panels. So the top section again is the front of our house pointing east and the bottom section is the rear of the house pointing west. Um, so you can see the contribution that each panel has made um, to our performance. The front of the house uh, pointing east continues to be the best performer, but now that, the, we're, that we're at the peak of the summer, the rear of the house is pulling its weight as well, besides that one panel which has uh, got a lot of shading on it from our neighbour's dormer. So I think this um, kind of highlights when the installer first came to take a look, they automatically assumed we only wanted panels on the rear of our house. And I said, nope, I want you to put panels everywhere. And it's a good thing that we put them at the front um, because they've turned out to be the best performers, particularly during those winter months where the back of the house was basically producing hardly anything throughout the day. It was the front of the house which was managing to trickle in a few kilowatts. So those panels um, were definitely the right idea. All right, if I move on then, let's talk about the best and the worst days. So our best day was the 22nd of June. 
not only for the month, but for the lifetime that we've had solar panels. Uh, we produced a whopping 42 kilowatts of power and we had a near perfect day here. You can see on the graph, we didn't have any overnight pull for power. The battery survived all night. Then we had blazing sunshine without any clouds all morning. So we, um, we've got a nice smooth kind of start to the graph there where we're charging up the battery. Um, the battery actually fills up by about 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning. So you can see on the bottom half where the orange bars are, there's a bit of gray, which begins to top, um, kind of tail off the bar. That's us exporting back to the grid because we've charged the battery and the immersion heater can only heat at three kilowatts and we're producing more than that. We're using more than that. So the rest goes to the grid. And on those days, we had already topped up the car. So there was no more energy to put in the car. So we, we gave it away. And that's why you see that weird gray shaped section amongst the orange bars at the bottom. That's us exporting to the grid. Um, mid afternoon, a little bit of cloud kind of popped along. So that's why the, the back end of the graph is not smooth. But then going into the evening, you can see that we had a fully charged battery. And then once the sun went down, we did not pull anything from the grid. The battery serviced everything. So we had two or three days which were quite good during the month of June like this. But the 22nd was the best. And on this particular day, we ended up giving back 11.8 kilowatts to the grid um, as surplus energy that we literally couldn't use anywhere. On the right hand side, looking at the worst day of the month, that was the 5th of June. So as I said on the previous slide, we had a few days of dodgy weather. Um, so on the 5th, although the battery lasted from the day before all the way through the night, when we it literally had run out at around 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning, so although the sun had come up, we weren't producing enough power. The battery had drained to empty, and so you can see around 9 o'clock, we're having to pull a bit of power from the grid in addition to the solar um, that's trickling in. Um, throughout the day, you can see there's moments where, um, although we're producing solar, we're still pulling more from the grid. So that means we're not really charging the battery during the day. There isn't enough surplus. Um, if there's a tiny bit, we use it up pretty quick. And then we're back to pulling from the grid. And then towards the afternoon, you can see a few weird looking spikes. So I guess this is the kettle or the oven or something coming on. And then uh, the, the solar power tails off around 7, 7.30 p.m. And we're immediately pulling power from the grid because we didn't have anything left in the battery. So although the 5th of June was our worst day, we still actually managed to produce 8.4 kilowatts, which is a very good day in the winter months. Um, and we still managed to accomplish... 54% energy independence on this day. So keep in mind that we had um, power saved up in the battery from the day before. We produced eight kilowatts of power. Um, so that, that that's how you get the calculation of 54%. It's because the power from the day before is contributing to the performance of this particular day. All right, if I move on to our household electricity consumption. So the key numbers here on the right hand side you can see that the green bar is growing, which is the power that the house is consuming from solar. The blue portion of the bar is shrinking, which is the amount of power that we're pulling from the grid. The orange section is the amount of power that we're managing to divert to the eddy. So we've managed to increase that as well and get some more free hot water. And the, the kind of salmon, salmon colored section at the top of the bar is the amount of energy that we're diverting into the EV charger for the car. So we've also managed to use the car some more and charge it up a bit more this month. At the very bottom of the graph, the gray section, the minus 64, this is what we're diverting back to the grid as surplus. So the good news here is that we've managed to consume more of the solar power to meet our house's demand to divert from gas and, and heat our hot water with free electricity and to charge the car. And we've also managed to reduce what we're pulling from the grid overall. So this is, you know, this is well on the way to being as optimal as possible. If I compare June's consumption to the prior year, we pulled 495 kilowatts last year in June 2021. And this year we pulled 550. 
So across the month, we have used in the house an extra 57 kilowatts across our various gadgets and whatever's going on compared to the year before. If I move forward then to talk about our household gas consumption, you can see June's bar is really small. So we've turned off the central heating. Um, you can see that we've got two gas supplies coming in the house. So the main portion of the house pulled 419 kilowatts. The other portion pulled 512 kilowatts. And we managed to put um, whatever it said on the previous slide um, um, into the eddy. So we've got a slightly increased orange section going into the eddy. Uh, for the month of June, 17% uh, of our power consumption was free because we diverted the electricity to offset the gas. So that's um, that's good news. I can't see that metric getting any higher, really. Um, but um, it's it's whatever we have is free. It's better than paying for it. In terms of overall consumption compared to the June of the prior year, we are consuming less than half um, the amount of gas that we consumed prior year. And compared to May, we've also managed to save ourselves about 600 kilowatts. So this is all good news in helping to keep the bills under control. If I keep moving forward then, here is a screenshot from the My Energy app. So this shows you the energy that the app or the device, the Eddy is diverting into our immersion heaters. So we have two immersion heaters in the system. And I know it's a bit hard to see on this screenshot, but there's a grey part of the graph and there's a kind of green or teal coloured part of the graph. They represent the two different immersion heaters that we have. So you can see on each day um, the amount of power that's going into each of them. You can see those early days in June where we had bad weather, it basically didn't have any surplus to divert into them. And on those good days, like around the 21st, 22nd of June, we're um, hitting some spikes and putting in loads of power. Let's keep moving. Let's look at our installer estimates. So our installer estimated that we're going to produce 4,916 kilowatts in our system. And to date, we've produced 3,440. So we're 70% of the way there. And well, we've got four months in which to, to get to target. So I think we're going to make it and I think we're going to go past target. Which is, which is good news. It basically means that the payback period is going to be quicker than the installer thought. Um, the left-hand kind of metric in yellow is showing what we consumed versus what the installer thinks. So the installer just took a blanket approach of saying we'll only consume 50% of what we generate. And so far we have beaten their expectation. We've consumed 3,193 kilowatts and they estimated we would consume 2,458. So we're at 130% already. So again, this also means that we're reducing the payback period because we're managing to consume a lot more than they thought. If I recall, they said the payback period on their charts was about 18 years, and they'd broken it into three chunks. And so if we're consuming more than they think, and if we're producing more than they think, then that's going to contribute to getting the numbers down. If you're finding these videos helpful, I would really appreciate it if you hit the like and subscribe button. Uh, not only does it help me try and reach my target of a thousand subscribers, it also helps get this video in front of more people and help them out if they're considering embarking on a solar powered journey. All right, let's keep going. Let's look at the peak power. So we hit a new high of 5.1 kilowatts this month. There is a day in June, it looks like it's around the kind of 10th of the month, and there's a second one towards the end of the month, which just crept over the five kilowatt mark. So this is the amount of power that all of the panels combined are producing in an instant. And this data is coming from Enphase, and they take an average over 15 minutes. So we've managed to average 5.1 kilowatts across 15 minutes. Um, if I look at the Give Energy data, which is a 10 second snapshot, I saw moments where we, get, we were getting 5.4 or 5.6 kilowatts. So again, given that our system max is 7.3 and our panels face east and west and not all facing south, I think getting to like 60 to 70% um, of capacity is pretty good. 
The average for the month of June was 4.2 kilowatts. So across all of the days, that's what we were getting. So that's, again, a really good number. And you can see the orange lines on here is the temperature uh, curve. Again, same comment as last month. I can't yet see the cor correlation, but I'll keep on tracking this in case it emerges as we move forward. All right, looking at our energy independence. So we hit an average of 95%. If you're paying attention, it's 96% according to the Enphase data. There's something going on in the rounding because I have to manually copy all these numbers down from Enphase and put it into a spreadsheet. Um, so I'm losing, I'm losing some granularity with all the decimal paces. Um, if any of you are good at writing APIs and feel like helping me out, um, I'm looking for help to get a dump of all the data at the most granular level from Enphase so I can automate these charts and hopefully become a bit more precise. But aside from that, 95 or 96% energy independence is fantastic. Um, you know, looking at the octopus bill, I think it came to about 20 pounds or something like that. So not very much. Um, with today's prices, I would imagine just our electricity bill alone would be in the 400 pound kind of region. So we've managed to save um, a load of money by managing to get solar powers and get all this stuff for free. And our lifetime energy independence is creeping up. So again, this chart says 59%, but the Enphase app says it's at 62%. So since we've had the system in November and we're still kind of weighted by the, the weaker winter months, we've accomplished uh, you know, about 59, 62% energy independence. And as the next kind of couple of summer months go by, I imagine we're going to drive that average up. Uh, my guess is it will probably settle on around two thirds, 65, 66% energy independence across a 12 month period, which is pretty good for the UK and pretty good given that um, my panels don't face south. All right, the final graph, the payback curve. So again, I haven't changed the graph, um, but I've got the table over here with all the numbers summarizing everything I just said. So let me kind of go through it top to bottom for you. Our capex has remained the same at 18 grand. But if you've seen the other video that I posted yesterday, our new 9.5 kilowatt battery has arrived. So in the next uh, update, you should see uh, about a three and a half grand increase in that to uh, cover the cost of the battery and the installation. There's, you'll see in the other video, I still have to get some cables to connect this battery up. So hopefully I can acquire those during this month and then get this battery connected up. Lifetime solar savings are now on £863. Uh, lifetime diesel savings by not driving our old car is at £270. We have saved £35 worth of gas by diverting free electricity to heat our hot water. Our EV charging costs have stayed the same. Um, basically, we charged the car when we first got it in January. We didn't have enough solar power, so the cost of that electricity was £9.58. So overall, if you add all of those numbers together and subtract the EV charging costs, we have saved £1,159 that we would have otherwise spent on electricity or gas or diesel. So that leaves an outstanding balance of £16,860 to break even on the system. We've managed to pay back 6.4% of our system cost so far. We've had the system in place now for just under eight months. And the forecasted payback number has got to that magic zone. We're on nine years and 11 months now to pay back the system. And if you recall from one of my very first videos, I said that I think the payback is going to be somewhere between eight and 11 years. So we're, we've got the number down to the right kind of ballpark. I would imagine July and August's numbers are going to drive this number down further, but not by much. We might get it to kind of eight years. Um, but then as we go into October and November, those those months with um, the weaker sunshine is going to drive the number up again. But I, th I think it's going to average out where I expect it, somewhere between eight, eight and 11 years. All right, looking at the table then, so if I, if I kind of go through the numbers for you, as I said before, our system produced 911.7 kilowatts of power. We exported 63.9 back to the grid. So that meant that we consumed in the house 847.8. Um, we imported 39.8 from the grid according to Enphase, but according to our electricity bill and the meter readings, we imported 
34 kilowatts. So there's a, there's a slight discrepancy of 5 kilowatts there from the CT clamps. From a consumption of 887.6 kilowatts, 196.9 kilowatts went into the eddy, 99.6 kilowatts went into the car, and therefore the house consumed 551.3. The house consumed 1,133 kilowatts of gas, but according to our supplier, consumed 936 kilowatts. I think this is this discrepancy is due to the calorific uh, kind of calculation, which changes based on the weather and the temperature, and so my formula is probably off somewhere. As I said before, the capex has stayed the same for the month of June, so the system has cost us just over eighteen grand. That includes all the kind of groundwork that we had to do in our case before we had to open up the floors and run run ducting for cables underneath to get to our meter. We had to have a chimney stack removed. Um, so these are kind of additional expenses that you may or may not incur if you were going to get your own system there. All right, the rose and grey are the unit prices for gas and electricity. We're on the Octopus Go tariff, so we have a nighttime rate as well. And these numbers include VAT. Um, our OPEX solar savings, so specifically for the month of June, the solar panel saved us £261.38 of electricity. The eddy saved us £14.45 worth of gas. The electricity going into the car saved us £111.59 worth of diesel. And in my local area, the average price was about £1.95 um, throughout the month. So that's why the number has gone up dramatically, even though the amount of driving we probably did was a bit less than the prior month. So total OPEX savings for the month of June was £387.42, giving us a cumulative total of 1159 And as I said, the balance outstanding is 16861 We've paid off 6.4% and the forecasted payback is nine years and 11 months. And remember, this is a linear calculation. I haven't done anything to take into account seasonality here. And you can see the trend across the previous years, particularly, sorry, on the previous months, particularly on the payback forecast. We've gone from 43 years to 37 to 30 to 19 to 13 to 9. So we're making a massive dent into that forecast. And what we can say for sure is the installer forecasting of roughly an 18 year payback is wrong. I think that they would roughly be on the money, but I don't think they've taken any account for the battery that we've got, which is which is managing to save up a lot of power from the day and then use it during the night. Um, so that I don't think their calculation represents that. And, and you can see that a nine-year payback or thereabouts sounds about right if you have a battery. And now you'll see from the other video, the second battery has arrived. So this is the Give Energy 9.5 kilowatt battery that we're going to daisy chain onto the system and what this means is that in the summer months we can store more of that surplus so it means that on those days where we don't have enough surplus energy to divert into the hot water we now have a second battery full of power that we can use to further reduce what we're consuming from the gas um, it means that we can charge the car kind of a bit more if we want to and it means that on those days where we seem to be kind of running the oven or something more in the evening and we're struggling to have enough power to get us through the night into the morning with a second battery full now we'll comfortably make it so that helps us to save you know saves ourselves from drawing one or two kilowatts in the in kind of in the morning around 5 a.m when the batteries run out and when we're on peak price um so i think it's going to help in the winter when there's definitely not enough solar power, my game plan with the batteries is to charge them both up to the max um, on the Octopus Go rate overnight. And so I've done my calculations across the four hours of cheap electricity. We will just about be able, be able to charge up the batteries to the max. And that will get us through most of the day. It's not going to get us through all of the day. Um, I, I expect it's going to get us to around 7, 8 p.m., something like that. And then we're still going to be drawing power 
in those evening hours from the grid at peak rate. But then once we get to half past 12, we're on the cheap rate. So we can draw power to service the house at the cheap rate. And we're, again, we're charging the battery. So what, what does this mean? Well, instead of paying roughly 30 pence a kilowatt for electricity, which is the normal rate, if I can charge up the battery overnight at 7.5 kilowatts and then discharge that during the day, when I would otherwise be paying 30 kilowatts, it means that the majority of my electricity I'm paying a quarter of the price for. So while 7.5 pence is still more expensive than what electricity used to cost before all of this escalation, it used to be around 4p, it still means that I am paying a quarter of what I would otherwise be paying if I didn't have these batteries in the system. And that's going to help reduce the payback period even more. All right, so this is my summary. So June has been a fantastic month. We had really, really good weather throughout. We've made loads of electri electricity. Uh, we've banked a load of money and we have um, got our new battery ready to install. So hopefully I get that installed and you'll find out next month what that's managed to help us out with. All right, thanks again for watching. If you've got any questions, uh, feel free to leave them in the comments. If you've got suggestions, feel free to leave them. I'm, I might be happy to kind of respond and do what I can. Otherwise, I'll catch you in the next video.